In case you were following along with the events of the gas station on my blog, I apologize that my website's been taken down so abruptly. For some reason, the city council found my public record of local events to be troubling. Uh, to the point that they had to hire a fancy Orwellian legal team to bury me in cease and desist. I'm trying to fight back. But as of last week, it looks like my entire site's been retroactively erased from existence. Presumably, these are the same guys who've been scrubbing all mention of our town from the internet. I know that these are not the sort of people that you're supposed to fight with, but after what happened to Gregory Fitz... I feel like a responsibility to continue journaling in one form or another. Some of you who followed my blog may remember Greg as the lawyer who volunteered to help out pro bono after I first started getting pushback from the concerned members of the city council. He even drove all the way out here last week just to have a talk with them. I'm very sorry to say that they found his remains yesterday in a hotel room, locked from the inside, of course. Officially, his death was declared a suicide before it was sealed. Deputy O'Brien managed to get a look at the police report, which claims he died of blood loss while attempting to eat his own hands. Admittedly, I didn't know Greg all that well. That just doesn't seem like something he would do. Anyway, until I can figure things out on the website, I've decided to continue chronicling the events of my day-to-day -day here. If you haven't been following my blog and have absolutely no idea who I am, that's okay too. Let me just say that there's only two things you need to know that will bring you completely up to speed. One, I work at the shitty 24-hour gas station at the edge of town. And two, weird things happen there. The owners decided to hire a third part-time clerk, and I don't know if it's because that they're getting tired of all the part-timers mysteriously disappearing, or if it's because they finally decided to fire Jerry. Or maybe they just know that my time here is running out, and they're hoping that I can train my own replacement before it's too late. Her name is Rosa, and despite her eager optimism, I guess she's pretty cool. She's a couple years younger than me, smart, very capable, and has exhibited a level of competence that I would categorize as, uh, quote, not at all like Jerry, which is something that I think the owners were really looking for in a new employee. The flip side, though, is that she is always asking questions that I don't have answers to. Why are there so many missing persons flyers on the bulletin board? What's with all the mold on the ceiling? Who's that guy in the trench coat that hangs out near the dumpster at all hours of the night? What's in these boxes labeled non-aspire? The owners asked Rosa to start immediately, as my shadow for the week's overnight shifts. You might think the owners would shut the place down for a couple hours for the holidays, but you'd be wrong. See, it took a literal court order to make them close their doors for a weekend last month after we found a mummified corpse in the walls. That's a story for a different time. She came into the gas station just as the sun was beginning to set, and we started with the basics. How to clock in, how to open a till, how to turn on pumps. Then I gave her the same speech I give all the new employees. Look, there are a bunch of rules to working at any job. We're no different. Show up on time, wear clothing, don't feed the raccoons, the store telephone is for paying customers only, 25 cents per minute, prepaid only, no exceptions, and just like every job, there are the unwritten rules. Here, the second list is a little longer. If something seems weird, you try to ignore it. In fact, the more you ignore, the better off you'll be. Don't keep track of time. Don't go off investigating weird noises on your own. Don't touch the garden gnomes with the green hats. Why? She asked. What's wrong with the gnomes with the green hats? Sometimes they bite. They set a few employees to urgent care for stitches. Wow. What about customers? Yeah, most of them bite too. Okay, what can you tell me about... You know. You know? She whispered this next part with a sly grin. The animals. This was the moment I first realized that Rosa's steadfast and defiant curiosity might be a problem. What about the animals? I asked. Well, I heard a rumor from Jerry that the woods way out here past the edge of town 
are full of strange fauna, and sometimes, when night falls, the inhabitants of the forest get brave and wander closer to the gas station. She said the whole thing in that stupid, spooky Vincent Price voice you use when reading a ghost story to a group of first graders? Uh, Jerry, you idiot. Look, Jerry says and smokes a lot of things. I wouldn't pay much attention. He also told me something else, she confessed. Is it true that you can't fall asleep? Yeah, it's true. That's pretty cool. No. No, not really. Right on cue, Jerry walked into the gas station wearing nothing but a wife beater jeans and a camo trucker hat covered in fresh snow. Some people like to go home once their shift ends. Some people even manage to stay away from their place of employment all the way until their next shift begins. But as he reminds me time and time again, Jerry is not, quote, some people. You guys, it's colder than a stepmother's kiss out there. As usual, he didn't wait for any response. He just grabbed the bottle of whiskey off the shelf then walked up to Rosa and pointed at a pack of Marlboros. What are you doing? She asked. Aren't you freezing? Oh yeah. Didn't you hear what I just said? I'm as cold as a witch's dick. Rosa handed over the pack of cigarettes and rang him up, saying, I don't think that's how the expression goes. You ever felt a witch's dick? It's pretty freaking cold. She chuckled. Does that pickup line ever work? You'd be surprised. She gave Jerry his total, but he just winked at her, put it on my employee tab before turning around and walking back out into the fallen snow. Rosa looked at me with a confused expression. How do I ring something up under an employee tab? <sighs> we don't have employee tabs. So, yeah, Jerry just robbed us. The night passed like most, boring and slow. The snowstorm had kicked up at high gear, dropping the customer count to a trickle, maybe one or two per hour. It doesn't take long to show the new girl everything there was to the job, and before too long my brain was back on autopilot, and I was relaxing in a chair with an open book, but a hard-boiled big city detective. Rosa took the utterly pointless initiative to clean the place up a little. I think the dullness of the job was really starting to test her limits. The grind of long hours and the space between those events that form memories is where I like to hide, where I can relax and wait. Forget about all the things knocking at the door of my mind. How many days have passed since the last time you slept? I wonder what she who shall not be named is doing right now. She promised you would see each other again. Will your mind still be intact when the disease takes you? Do you think she'll come to your funeral? Yep, take those thoughts, push them back into the vault, and focus on the shitty book you bought from the library clearance sale. Around midnight, Rosa ran up to the counter with a cardboard box and slammed it down in front of me. I looked up to see an enormous smile on her face. Yo, check out what I found in the storage closet! Before I could say, no thanks, she flipped the box upside down and dumped the contents onto the counter. It was a giant, tangled ball of Christmas lights, plastic garland, holiday decorations, and a freshly dead mouse. Oh, she said. Her smile instantly evaporated. I didn't know about the mice. I put my book down and started refilling the box while she went and found some napkins to wrap the rodent. About an hour later, the decorations were back in the storage room. The mice were all stuffed together in an old shoebox and I was leaning against my crutches in the pouring snow while Rosa dug a tiny grave. There was something particularly cathartic about watching somebody else dig a hole next to the gas station thinking to myself if she only knew all the things that happened with that shovel. I highly doubt that she'd be so gung-ho about putting her fingerprints all over it. I selected one of those few spots where we hadn't already buried something horrific, and once the mice were in the ground, Rosa gave a short eulogy. Christmas mice? Oh, Christmas mice, how we never knew ye. I'm sorry you all died in a box in the supply closet, but I'm grateful that at least you didn't have to die alone. We pray that you don't haunt this gas station. Instead, may you find your peace in heaven, or whatever your mouse religion equivalent is. Yeah, probably Valhalla. When they say not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse, we will know that it wasn't for lack of trying. She looked at me and asked, anything to add? 
My mind jumped to a short list of mouse-based puns, but instead, I decided to go with, yeah, somebody once came into the gas station trying to be a dick, and he told me that I was nothing but a little mouse. I think he meant it as an insult, but I didn't take offense. She nodded. That was really nice. We all started making our way back into the gas station. I heard a voice from just beyond the tree line whispering, Hey! Rosa stopped and looked back. Did you hear that? The freezing wind carried with it a noise that almost sounded like children giggling as it blew against the back of my neck. Nope, I said. Let's go back inside. It was some time later when the store phone rang. Now, I had gone to the supply closet to grab a bucket of salt for the front steps, so Rosa was the one to pick it up. I could hear her side of the conversation and didn't think too much about it until I heard the very last words. It's not bad, I think. This is my first day here. Oh. Oh, I like it. I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Rosa. Yeah, actually. He's right here. Did you want to talk to him? Oh, oh, sure thing. I'll let him know. You too, Spencer. Oh, shit. She smiled at me and said, That was a friend of yours. Spencer... Middleton, I said with a sigh. Yeah! Once again, I watched her smile disappear. I guess she could tell from the look on my face. This was not good news. I need to make a phone call. Then, I think it's probably about time that I told you... Uh, something. Back in high school, we all pretty much knew that Spencer was a certifiable psychopath. But growing up in a small, boring, podunk town, we didn't have the societal framework to process this sort of thing. Finding him the help he needed was simply not a feasible option, and most people just said a prayer for him and called it done. At one point, the principal delegated the responsibility to the school counselor slash gym coach, who tried to talk to Spencer about his feelings. But all this was just the equivalent of putting a band-aid on a grease fire. There was a rumor around that time that Spencer was the one who had killed all those dogs. But when I told my mother about this, she just looked at me and said, Well, don't go near him with any dogs. After dropping out, he joined the army and worked his way up through the ranks until somebody recognized his... Let's say, talents, and gave him a special assignment in a black budget program specializing in enhancing interrogation techniques, which is just a flashy way of saying torture. There's no official record of any of this, and the only reason I know is because he told me all these things one night to pass time while I dug my own grave at gunpoint. But Deputy O'Brien managed to intervene and arrest him before he could follow through, but Spencer escaped captivity after a few days, and for the last couple of months has been a wanted but elusive fugitive. Sometimes he calls me at work to remind me of the good times we had together, and to assure me that he'll be seeing me again soon. Now, I don't know if it's luck that's been keeping him from killing me, or the sadist in him is prolonging this intentionally. Tonight, he told Rosa to let me know that he was in the area. As for why Spencer wanted to kill me, let me simply say that maybe I deserve it, and maybe I don't, and we should leave it at that. The first thing I did was call O'Brien, but it went straight to voicemail. The second thing I did was tell all of this to Rosa, who listened patiently until I finished to ask the obvious question. So, do you have a gun or anything? In case he comes back? No, I... I'm not really a gun guy. Ninja stars, bazooka, flamethrower, chainsaw, any of the... weapon type stuff? No. Oh, well, shit. Maybe you deserve to be killed. Should we lock the doors or something? Oh yeah, that's another thing. Spencer knows how to get inside the gas station even when the doors are locked. He's done it, like, a couple of times before, and we haven't been able to figure out how. Well, crap, man! Is there anything else terrifying about him that you want to tell me? I once saw Spencer get his head cut halfway off and bleed out on the gas station floor, and he still somehow came back without any lasting damage. No, not really. The gas station door swung open, causing Rosa to squeak and jump. Hey guys, said the inebriated man in the oversized fur coat as he staggered into the store. Hey Jerry, I said back. Where you been? You know the roads are all shut down, he said, avoiding the question. It didn't matter. I already knew the answer. Rosa asked, what about the roads? Jerry braced himself against the frozen drink machine and answered, yeah, it's all over the radio. If you were a little closer, I probably would have smacked him. God knows he deserved it. Really, Jerry? The radio? We're not supposed to talk about it, but... Some time ago, Jerry started a pet project building a POW-style shortwave radio, just to see if he could. He uncoiled an old Brillo pad and 
wrapped it around the toilet paper roll for the inductor, went to vulture on a couple of electronics in the storage. Eventually, ended up with something that actually picked up a few low-quality AM country stations. It also picked up something else. The signal is always weak. But if we put the radio in just the right spot, we can hear a man with a Slavic accent reading or discussing news relevant to our town in short, simple, choppy sentences. The weird thing is, he's always talking, no matter what. 24 hours a day without taking any breaks and never repeating himself. The temperature is 84 degrees. There are three more people in town than yesterday. The ratio of pig to human in town is approximately 2.078 to 1. The mayor's wife is asleep. The time is 24 hours and 16 minutes. The butcher shop is closed. The light is on at the high school gym. He talks about people in town, where they're eating for dinner, how many pairs of shoes they own, their favorite clothes and numbers, random facts, sometimes connected, sometimes not. We did a couple of experiments and learned that the radio signal gets a little stronger the further we go into the woods, and once we get past the gas station heading into town, the signal drops to nothing. We listened to him off and on for a few days, as well to starve off boredom during slow shifts, but eventually we started to get a little concerned. The things he reported on were always so specific and bizarre, and some of what the voice repeated nobody should have been able to know. Who didn't love who anymore? What high school student was about to find out she was pregnant? Which local business was about to receive a random health inspector visit? How many days the milk at the grocery store had left before it turned bad? And who was going to buy it? And when? We had theorized it was just an elaborate work of fiction, until one day the voice announced Sean Buckley's death in a car accident eight hours before it happened. Then the voice started talking about us. Talking to us, even. There's a man at gas station. He uses name Jack. He still has one baby tooth. He has been diagnosed with fatal familial insomnia. He is threat level 8. He is aware of transmission. There is another man at gas station. His name is Jeremy. He is threat level echo. He is aware of transmission. He is 30 years old. He is looking at Jack. The men at gas station have built transmission receiver. Jeremy at gas station is moving towards transmission receiver. He is dismembering transmission. After that night, we made a pact to never listen to the radio again. And to add the transmission to that long list of try and forget stories, I think what most people swear on their lives not to do something again, they don't do it. Did I mention that Jerry isn't most people? There is a freak snowstorm, the worst one in a decade. All the roads leading into town are completely impassable. You know the drill. Mandatory curfew. State of emergency. Cats and dogs living together. Jeremy waved his arms in the air dramatically. Two dead, one missing. He grabbed a cup, filled it with cherry cola flavored frozen drink, and started to down it. If all the roads are impassable, and where the hell did you just come from? asked Rosa. I whispered to her. Remember that thing I told you about ignoring the weird stuff? Jerry screamed, Ah! Oh, what is it? Brain freeze! Well, at least we still have... Right then, the power went out. Leaving the gas station in complete pitch blackness. I used my phone's flashlight until I could find our box of emergency supplies, then somehow managed to drag it from the storage room with one hand while holding both crutches in the other. <sighs> I'm sure Jerry was just being kind by allowing me to do it on my own so I could retain my independence and sense of worth. But seriously, dude, you see me dragging this heavy-ass thing, you really just not gonna offer any help? Once I had made it to the front of the store, Jerry sat down cross-legged and started going through the box. 
handing supplies out to the four of us. I had packed plenty of extra batteries, half a dozen flashlights, some bottled water, emergency rations, matches, flares, and more than enough- Wait a second. Four of us? Holy shit! I yelled, fumbling with the flashlight Jerry had handed me. After a painfully awkward few seconds, I managed to get the damn thing to turn on, and I pointed it at the other shadow standing in the room. Jerry, Rosa, and... Oh, Deputy O'Brien. Hey, you mind not pointing that in my eyes? She asked. Deputy Amelia O'Brien was the latest in an ever-growing list of deputy babysitters assigned to the gas station, getting all the way back to as long as I can remember. Some of them died. One of them went crazy. And then there's her. A tough-as-brick Brooklyn transplant with an itchy trigger finger and a long history of giving as many fucks as there are planets named Pluto. She was a very welcome sight. <laughs> Sorry, I said, pointing it back down. When did you get here? Just now, when you were off bumble-fucking around in the closet. I called to check on you 30 minutes ago, but nobody answered, and I nearly killed myself ten times driving through this blizzard to get here. What the hell happened? Rosa perked up. Oh! We were probably outside doing the funeral when you called. She unsnapped the gun in her holster. You... what? I explained quickly. It was for a bunch of mice. Jerry brustled. And you didn't invite me? O'Brien shook her head and said, That actually does not clear anything up. I took a deep breath and broke the bad news. It's a good thing you're here. Spencer called again. Said that he's in the area. Jerry opened the emergency pack of jerky, took a bite, and then said, That kid is... So in love with you. The deputy raised an eyebrow at the new girl. Who are you? I'm Rosa. It's my first day. Amelia O'Brien. Really? You don't look like an O'Brien. What does an O'Brien look like? An awkward silence followed. And then Jerry broke it by exclaiming, Yeah, we finally passed the bachelor test. It's a nice change of pace. Usually, when we end up trapped at the gas station, it's a total sausage fest. Usually? This happens before? Uh, once or twice. O'Brien spoke in her walkie-talkie. Dispatch is O'Brien. You read me? Over. Silence. Dispatch, are you hearing me? Over. More silence. She sighed and dug a dollar out of her pocket, handing it over to me, and she said, I need to use the store phone. But before I could even take the money, the phone started ringing. She shot me a look and said, Hey, crutches, pick it up. Put it on speaker. Without thinking, I tucked the flashlight into my mouth, Crossed the store, and when I got there, I reached out to answer, then immediately spat the flashlight out and yelled, Oh my god! What? O'Brien shot back. I put that in my mouth and mice have been doing weird stuff to it. I put it in my mouth! Store phone rang a couple more times. O'Brien said, Just answer the damn phone! I did. Hello? Hey, Jack. It's been too long. I pressed the button to switch to speakerphone. Hey, Spencer. Who's your new friend? I looked at O'Brien, he made a weird hand gesture that could have meant keep him talking, or yeehaw, let's rob this bank. Between the current context, I assumed that it was the former. Oh, her? Uh, the girl that you talked to earlier is my new jujitsu instructor. I had to fire the last one because he hadn't already taught me everything he knew. I've been getting pretty rad since the last time I saw you, also I'm taller now. She doesn't look like a jujitsu instructor to me. And neither does the lady deputy next to her. And is that Jerry? He looks drunk. O'Brien pulled out her service pistol, crisscrossed it with her flashlight in the opposite hand, and started pointing it at each of the windows and doors. Jerry always looks drunk, I said. Hey, <laughs> said Jerry with a hiccup. O'Brien took the phone from me and slammed it into the cradle before yelling, Everybody get away from the windows right now! Jack, take the others, lock yourselves in the storage closet, go! I sighed and said, Fine. The next few hours were pretty damn boring. O'Brien had checked our perimeter, called for backup, and declared the situation tentatively safe in the time it took Jerry and Rosa to fall asleep in the closet. I covered them in packing blankets, then put one around my shoulders and tried to read my book by candlelight. But the situation was just too distracting to let myself get into it. O'Brien eventually joined us in the small room, reporting that there were no signs of Spencer anywhere. And if it wasn't for the fact that somebody had slashed all the tires on our cruiser and Rose's Volkswagen Beetle, she might have been tempted to believe that he was just yanking our chain. So, what's the deal with the backup? I whispered to her as she came and sat down on a milk crate next to me. The others were knocked out, and I was just fine letting them sleep off as much as they could. 
O'Brien looked at them while she searched for the words. I don't know what's going on with you, Crutches, but ever since I was assigned to this job, my life has gotten exponentially weirder with every passing day. Yeah, I said, picking up the edge from my blanket and putting it over her shoulders. She moved in a little closer and whispered, Talk to the sheriff. He sent in a snow truck out here first thing in the morning. Tried to tell him that this needs to be a priority, but evidently this is a snowmageddon. Can't afford to stretch his precious resources any further tonight. Yeah, that sounds about right. What about her? I thought you and Jerry pretty much ran this place. I laughed. <laughs> we don't run anything. She put a warm arm around my shoulder and said, Yeah, I'm really going to miss you when you die. Thanks. That's um pretty presumptuous of you. So far, I've outlived almost every deputy they sent. Rosa shot up, eyes wide open, with a look of sheer terror. Hey, I said. Did we wake you up? Did you hear that? She said in a voice that did not sound anything like Rosa's voice. A cold shiver ran down my spine. Hear what? He's coming! Almost here! When he gets it, we're all over! We can't let him have it! Girl, said O'Brien, you're freaking us out. Who's coming, Spencer? She's dreaming, I said. One of my foster brothers used to do the same thing. Her eyes are open, but she's talking in her sleep. Right then, her eyes rolled way back into their sockets, revealing nothing but veiny white bulges. Did your foster brother do that too? Okay, I admitted. That is different. She slowly began to stand up, clutching the blanket to her chest, and then continued speaking in the same weird voice. Every living being will be transferred into a conduit of agony and suffering if he finds what he's looking for. You will all beg for death, but it will never come. An unfathomable horror of worlds, inconceivable, is at your gate. Do not open the door. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Is it a gate or a door? Fix your metaphors, creepy nightmare Rosa. O'Brien stood up and looked at me. Should I wake her? Right then, Rosa dropped her blanket, revealing that she was actually floating about eight or nine feet off the ground. Oh, we both said at the same time. It might have been a little bit of an overreaction to shoot Rosa with a taser gun, but then again, it might have been that there was no changing what already happened. Rosa fell into Jerry, waking them both up in a screaming fit of expletives and confusion. It took a good 20 minutes before Rosa was calmed down enough for us to pull the prongs out of her skin and get her patched up. We were all in front of the store, Rosa sitting on the counter while O'Brien put the finishing touches on her bandages. Why the hell would you shoot me with a taser? Always with the questions, Rosa. You were sleep floating, I explained. Oh, she said. Sorry about that. I, I didn't mean to. Hey, guys, said Jerry. What do you suppose that is? He pointed at something just on the other side of the glass door that looked at first glance like a body slumped against it. On closer inspection, I became certain that it was, in fact, a body slumped against it. O'Brien drew her gun and carefully walked over, undid the lock, and opened the door just enough for the body to fall halfway into the gas station along with a freezing blast of wet air. Crap on a cracker, said Jerry. Is that Spencer? He was. He had a busted lip, swollen black eye, scrapes and bruises covering his face like he had gone ten rounds with a dump truck, but O'Brien was smart enough not to let her guard up. She kept one finger on the trigger while she checked for signs of breathing, which, sadly, she found. She put the unconscious Spencer in handcuffs, dragged him into the store, and then handed me another dollar before calling into the sheriff's office. Do you think this is going to be enough? I asked. One pair of handcuffs? He's unconscious and unarmed. What exactly did you have in mind? I said, I don't know, maybe we can tie him up. At the same time that Jerry blurted out, wooden stake through the heart. We compromised, found a roll of duct tape, and secured him to a rolling chair, then pushed the chair into the supply closet that then was nailed shut. Thirty minutes later, we heard the pounding on the roof. Slam! The first one jolted us all to high attention. We didn't have but maybe two seconds before the next. Slam! Maybe a tree branch had fallen over in a storm. Slam! 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 They started coming frequently, like a muffled machine gun. Slam! 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 What the hell is that? O'Brien bellowed. Slam! 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 They came together. Five to ten each second, and then... Just as suddenly as it started, the pounding on the roof came to an end. Maybe it was Hale, I suggested. Or maybe, offered Jerry, it was him. Escaping. He pointed at the room Spencer was in. 
How does that make any sense? Asked O'Brien. Lady, we are way past the point of making any sense, he answered. Then added, I think you know that. That was all it took to convince O'Brien to pry the nails back out of the door to Spencer's makeshift prison. But once we got it open, we saw that he was still there, duct taped to the chair. We all breathed a collective sigh of relief before. Yeah, well, hey there, everyone, Spencer said with a sly smile. Merry Christmas. Now, which of you wants to let me out of this chair? Spencer Middleton, said O'Brien. You're under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say... Christ, O'Brien, are we really going to do this again? Just set me free. Give me a weapon. You clearly have no idea what's out there right now. You think I did this to myself? Trust me. You're going to need my help. We probably should have gone with a steak. Spencer was still yelling at us as O'Brien closed the door again. Okay, she said. We need to check out what that noise was. Uh, no, no, we really don't, I responded. Rosa grabbed me by the arm for some reason, then said to the deputy, You can't leave us alone with this guy! Jeremy announced, I'll go check the noise. If I'm not back in five minutes, assume the worst. You're not going by yourself, snapped O'Brien. Fine, he said. Let's all go together. Rosa squeezed my arm tighter. I'd... I'd rather take my chances in here. Okay, said O'Brien near her wit's end. Then we split up. Are you freaking kidding me, I said. Are we really gonna Scooby-Doo this? Apparently, we Scooby were. And after a few more rounds of discussing, we Scooby did. It was decided that Jerry and I would go check out that noise while O'Brien and Rosa stayed and watched the prisoner. Hey, O'Brien told me just as we left on our wholly unnecessary suicide mission. I can handle Floaty Girl and Duct Tape Boy on my own, but you need to take this, just in case. I don't know why people are always trying to give me guns. I'm not a gun guy. Last time I had a gun, you know what? Don't even worry about the last time I had a gun. Plus, I need both hands just to move around. I'll take it, said Jerry. Have you ever fired a gun before? She asked. That depends, he answered. Are you a cop? She let out a defeated sigh and handed him her pistol. Try not to die, guys, okay? Rosa looked at us nervously and tried to offer some words of support. Be careful. I'd hate for this night to turn out to be a... What's the opposite of a sausage fest? Jerry answered, a clambery. Right. I'd, I'd hate for this to turn out to be a clambery. Jerry led the way with his two perfectly functioning legs pointing the gun and flashlight in front of him while he kicked a trail through the thick pile of snow that had settled knee-deep outside the gas station. We trudged through the frozen landscape until we were safely under the vehicle overhang next to the fuel pumps. Then he scanned the area with the light, revealing dozens of small holes in the fresh snow, like tiny baseball-sized craters. From here, he could see the roof of the gas station, as well as the piles of tiny winged creatures caught up in the gutters and slowly being swallowed by snow. I dug my own flashlight out of my coat pocket and scanned the area under the overhang, finding six or seven dead birds around the edges. It wasn't the first time I'd seen this, but it was the first time I know of where it happened right on top of the store. We get strange weather patterns out here, and every once in a blue moon, birds get confused and forget which way is up and fly straight into the ground in mass. Local scientists blame everything from fireworks to pesticides, but officially, the cause is unknown. All I know is that it's frickin' weird. Hey, check this out. I turned to see Jerry had plucked one of the creatures out of the snow and was holding it in his hands. Dude, don't touch that! It might have herpes! Look, he said, and pulled a long coil of copper wire out of the bird's corpse. I shrugged. But times are tough. He threw the bird back into the snow and wiped his hands on his pants. Should we go back inside? Yeah, in just a minute. But first, we need to talk. I really hate this part. Honestly, I'd rather face one of the creatures from the forest than have a serious chat with Jerry, but sometimes we don't get a choice. Fine. I'll come clean, he said. The mice were mine, but they were dead when I bought them. I, I used them for, for snake food. I, I didn't know. The radio, you, you put it back together? He blinked a few times and slowly pulled out his pack of Marlboros. So he put one in his mouth, slowly lit it, and took a drag, and then said, I really didn't have anything planned for this part, so I let his question hang there in the air for a minute. 
Did it say anything else? Oh, not much. Mostly about the snowstorm and... He trailed off. And... I asked. And it said that... Sagoth has risen. He took another drag. Are you sure... He didn't say... A savior has risen? Like... Some kind of Christmas thing? He said it like ten times in a row. Sagoth has risen. Sagoth has risen. You get the point. Sagoth has risen. Etc. I thought that it was kind of weird because I I never heard him repeat anything before. We stood there in silence until he finished his cigarette. Then he looked back up at me. So you ready to go back inside now? We both heard the sneeze at the same time. It came from somewhere down the road, leading into the forest. And if I could have jumped, I probably would have. What the hell was that? Jeremy said in a frantic whisper. It was a sneeze! Where's the gun? Jerry looked at the ground. I followed his eyes and pointed the flashlight at the blank spot in the snow next to the set of raccoon feet shaped prints leading off into the forest. I repeated the question slowly. Jeremy? Where is the gun? I set it down to pick up the dead bird. You don't think Rocco made off with it, do you? Rocco, our resident mutant trash panda. I highly, highly doubt that Rocco didn't steal it. We both looked at each other with that what do we do now look, and then Jeremy yelled out, Bless you! All well, the stupid ways I've imagined of dying at the gas station. This was not one of them. A voice called back from somewhere deep in the blizzard. Hello? Is anybody there? No! I yelled back. Huh. Sure sounds like somebody to me! The voice was getting closer. I tried to do some quick math. Could I run back to the gas station before the source of that voice reached us? Probably not. A figure started to emerge in the snowstorm. A man-shaped figure. As it got closer, the details came into focus, and before long, the man was underneath the awning with us, casually walking towards us, his hands in his pockets, snow covering his hooded blue jacket. He walked right up to us and asked if he could bum a smoke. I watched the guy light it up, take a drag, and notice that there was something strangely familiar about him. He was five foot ten, early thirties, dark brown eyes, short and well-maintained beard, thin but in good shape, and he was wearing a coat. It was way too big on him. After a few moments, he asked, You guys know if a gas station is open? His voice was tip of the tongue familiar. Yeah, there's no power, I answered, but the phone still works if you pay in advance. Who are you guys? You part of the emergency service crew or something? No. Uh, we work here. Uh, we got snowed in. No shit. I was driving through, I got stuck. Been waiting in my car down the road for the past couple hours, but the engine just died. Thought I was gonna freeze to death out here. We shook our hands, and we introduced ourselves before Jerry finally asked the question that was on my mind since we first saw the guy. Hey, uh, you aren't Donald Glover? He laughed. <laughs> yeah, I am. I knew it! We were standing outside talking to a famous actor slash director, Donald Glover, at my gas station! Holy shit, I said. What are you doing here? I was driving through, answered the Grammy Award-winning musical performer, Donald Glover. You were just driving through? On Christmas Eve? He shrugged. Got lost. I looked at Jerry, and then I looked back at primetime Emmy awardee Donald Glover, who asked, So, is it cool if I come inside and warm up? Of course! Yelled Jerry before handing a spare flashlight to multiple Golden Globe winning writer slash comedian Donald Glover and leading the way back to the store. Once we were back inside, we introduced O'Brien and Rosa to five-time WGA award recipient Donald Glover, and I thought it was pretty cool. This was the second most famous person to ever step into the store. As, as if that really was Elvis that one time. But the girls were not impressed. In fact, they seemed more concerned about why we were returning without O'Brien's pistol. Jerry explained that we were attacked by a herd of ninjas. But O'Brien wasn't buying it. Before I could tell them about the birds, the store phone rang again. I was the closest, so I picked up while O'Brien gave Hollywood superstar Donald Glover a packing blanket to wrap up in. Hello, I said. The owner of the store was on the other end and let out an annoyed growl, then said, Jack, it's me. Benjamin? 
How many times have I asked you not to use my name on the phone? Oh, I'm sorry. It was Benjamin. <laughs> the crotchety, bearded man that occasionally shows up at the gas station and shoots and blows things up. I would say more, but that's literally almost everything I know about him. What's going on over there? I'm looking at the weather reports right now and the gas station looks like somebody opened up a portal to the center of the ninth circle of hell. Yeah, I said. Thanks for checking. By the way, I found your blog online. Oh? <laughs> yeah, what'd you think? I think you don't know the difference between a clip and a magazine. From here on out, I'd appreciate if you left me out of those little stories. Okay. I will. Um, are you going to be showing up this time? Thank you, Tori. I'm in Greece right now, looking for a status report. Something, uh, something beat the shit out of Spencer. Um, oh, and then we lost power again. Oh, uh, oh, by the way, uh, does Sagoth has risen mean anything to you? Sagoth! They asked the name of the shape-shifting demon. If he's anywhere near the gas station, you boys need to hunker down and pray, because that son of a bitch can look like anyone. Feeds off pain and leaves his victims stripped of all their skin. Oh, damn, I said. It's a good thing we found Donald Glover when we did. What followed? was an agonizingly long pause. Hello? Did I lose you? Who the hell is Donald Glover? You know, the critically acclaimed musical genius. He performs under the pseudonym Childish Gambino. He's a rapper. He raps. Yeah, okay, I bet he's a great kisser too. Jack, did you somehow become dumber since the last time I saw you? What do you mean? Motherfucker! I just googled him! Donald Glover is at home with his family in Atlanta right now. You're in the presence of a shape-shifting demon. Well, maybe the one in Atlanta is the double, and the real one is in the gas station. He made that growling noise again and said, mm, Only way to kill a demon like this is to take off his head. Goodbye, dumbass. And the line went dead. Jeremy came and sat on the counter and said, All right. I'm not making any offers or anything. I just want to know your opinion. Do you think we're more likely or less likely to have an orgy now that Donald Glover is here? Jerry? Listen closely. I said in a low voice. We have to kill Donald Glover. Okay, he said, hopping back to his feet. Let's do it. How? Jesus. Didn't even need an explanation or anything. We, we need to cut off his head. Nice. Well, I... I had one ally on board that I knew that convincing two more people to help us cover up yet another brutal murder at this gas station might be difficult. Assuming we could figure out a way to kill not Donald Glover, and also assuming that he really was a demon, and also assuming that demons are even real. Benjamin was feeding me true information, and none of this was just a vivid hallucination caused by a rapidly deteriorating mental state. Man, when I lay it all out like that? <sighs> It's a lot to take on faith before committing decapitation.